This UCSD TV program is a presentation of University of California Television for educational and non commercial use only. Sincere welcome to our Founders Day celebration, the symposium which kicks off the three-day event. This event highlights one of UC San Diego's greatest strengths, the breadth and depth of its faculty. We created the Innovation Symposium last year when we reached our half-century mark, and as we brainstormed on how we could retain that same momentum, but cut back from what was obviously a great celebration for 50 years to one for 51, We've been known for innovation as a recurring theme among our faculty, staff, students, and alumni. From our visionaries who, who, our visionary founders who established the tradition of excellence on this campus, to our present day campus members who carry on that tradition, we know that innovation is what we are. And it's fitting that we're hosting tonight two lectures, one in the newest and most innovative facilities that we have on campus. This new building, the Medical Education and Technology Building, has state-of-the-art design and technology. It's a place where students and physicians will be able to inter interact very strongly, use new and innovative techniques like surgical robotics. The facility itself will provide access to healthcare by using telemedicine to take what we've learned and share it with the world. That is one of the greatest things about the motivation in the last century. We can now reach out to people around the world in a way that simply was not possible 50 years ago. It means we can help even more people in the community, save even more lives, improve the quality of life for millions and even billions of people. So that's what our mission is at UC San Diego, to use the best of our scholarly work across disciplines to achieve an important objective. We're here to make a positive mark on our civilization and to enhance that with discoveries from medical and technological breakthroughs. So we're here tonight to give our citizens in San Diego a brief snapshot of what's happening around the world. Tonight we celebrate our innovation, our achievements in a new era. I hope you'll enjoy the, instruction, the lectures of four of our top innovators. So getting on with the program, it's now my pleasure to in introduce our Executive Vice Chancellor, Suresh Subramani, who will tell you some more about what's gonna to happen tonight. Suresh. I, I'm really pleased to have all of you here to start a new innovative idea, and this is our new uh, theme that we're going to do uh, in future years, and we're going to focus today on uh, a Founders Innovation Symposium where we showcase and highlight some of the visions that we have for the future. And in doing so, it really affords us an opportunity to honor the tradition of innovation and interdisciplinary research that is so typical of this campus that our founders paid so much attention to, and we do this while also celebrating what we can do together in the future with all of your help. Now, as Marianne said, we just finished celebrating an inspirational 50th anniversary uh, celebration this last year, and as we look forward, our academic leaders at UC San Diego are working to develop a cohesive, long-term vision for research and education that will sustain us into the next couple of decades and indeed for the next 50 years and beyond. To get there, of course, we build on familiar strengths that are familiar to UCSD. This involves faculty collaboration across disciplines to really produce transformative research with societal impact. And in doing so, we really uh, uh, follow the footsteps that Roger Revell established in his so eloquent uh, statement that we must be distinctive in everything that we do. I want to give you a few examples of the kind of transformative research with societal impact that we're doing at UCSD. And let me begin with our neighbors uh, across the street at Scripps Institute of Oceanography, where they're working with the Rady School of Management on the general campus to develop a new executive level training program in climate science, 
as well as a new master's program in marine conservation and biodiversity with a policy framework that really taps into the expertise and knowledge that we have bringing in economists from the general campus as well as other faculty who will team up with uh, researchers at the NOAA Southwest Fisheries uh, Lab to develop and teach more of the innovative courses in this particular area. Now moving on to our surroundings in, in, on the health science campus, uh, health sciences is partnering with the Jacob School of Engineering to engage faculty from various departments across UC San Diego in the study of human health and disease in the development of improved diagnostics, technologies, and indeed treatments. And all of this comes under the umbrella of a new institute called Engineering in Medicine. And I want to digress a little bit to, to really acknowledge one of our founders for this Institute of Engineering in Medicine, and in fact, our latest uh, newest uh, recipient of the National Medal of Science, Dr. Xu Chen, who is uh, uh, right here. Okay. So uh, Xu Chen was honored just a few weeks ago by, by President Obama and, and uh, for his pioneering work in cardiovascular physiology and bioengineering. He was one of the founding members of our own bioengineering department, which is one of the highest ranked in the nation. His work paved the way for the use of engineering principles, which is really the theme of engineering and medicine, to advance our understanding of and solutions for human health conditions. He joined the ranks of, of, of seven other National Medal of uh, Science recipients at UC San Diego, and we have just this year hit a trifecta. Three years ago, we had uh, Clay, Craig Venter, one of our alumni, who got the National Medal of Science. Last year, our own chancellor was a National Medal of Science recipient, and this year, we have one of our most respected faculty getting this award. So um, I think this is really a testament to the quality of our faculty and the ways in which they are driving the research focus at the university. In the area of drug discovery, there are early incredible untapped resources that reside in the oceans. This is the unexplored uh, territory at this point. And researchers at the Skag School of Pharmacy just across the street on, on the, this side, uh, as well as the fac SIO scientists and faculty on the general campus, including those in chemistry and biochemistry, are coming together to really collaborate and discover new drugs from the sea and combining this with innovative technologies of drug delivery, uh, working with the people in engineering to, to really transform medicine at a personal level. And at a more global level, global health and research training, much of the training going on in this particular camp, uh, the, uh, bu building, uh, as the chancellor talked about, brings together physicians as well as public health specialists, health economists, international relations and Pacific Rim Studies faculty to really uh, work together with environmental experts around the campus to promote the study of uh, international health challenges while also really treating medical ed education and public health training uh, and providing these opportunities for all of our UC San Diego students. An important example of this is the research of one of our close colleagues at SIO, uh, Dr. Ramanathan, who has found that the black carbon and soot that is generated from burning uh, uh, things like cow dung and, and wood and so on is really contributing to global climate as well as uh, uh, problems in human health. And he is doing small scale experiments at this point in time to really make, uh, to show people that you can, if you wean people away from these uh, cookers and, and use uh, solar uh, cookers instead, that this really impacting the climate as well as the health of the individuals who are using these. And, we would love to work with the rest of the campus to scale this up to really make an impact on a much uh, uh, within a state or a region. And many of these experiments are currently being done in India. Now, on the general campus, I've had a wonderful time, despite our dire budget and so on, working with the deans and the faculty, really trying to position the university for the next decade and the next 50 years. We've looked back and seen all the wonderful things that the campus has achieved in the last 50 years. And we've taken the best lessons from those and distilled the key principles that allowed us to succeed. And this is what we're trying to do for the next uh, decade or so. So this evening, you'll hear about three of our research in initiatives. And as Chancellor Fox said, you'll hear a glimpse of what each of these are about. And the first one of these is quantitative and systems biology. The second one is design, broadly defined. And the third one is advanced energy technology. 
And what I hope you will hear from the deans is their vision of how this will transform society and the campus at large. Now, although UC San Diego has been recognized for its interdisciplinarity, in fact, we have the fewest departments uh, compared to any other UC campus, and I like to think that this is a university without walls that really allows faculty to mingle uh, freely uh, depending on their research interests, which might be dynamic and changing over time. But we really want to continue our efforts to bring Health Sciences, Scripps Institute of Oceanography, and the general campus together in everything that we do. And we also see unique and exceptional opportunities on the La Jolla Mesa. And a wonderful exemplar of this is our new stem cell research uh, facility, which will open next week, which will bring together faculty from the Burnham Scripps uh, uh, Research Institute, the Salk Institute, as well as UC San Diego, to work together in one building, in a sharing uh, resources and rubbing shoulders with each other to really transform what we know about stem cells, how can they, they can be used to transform uh, human medicine. Now, these partnerships and intellectual hubs of activity really reflect a theme that UC San Diego is famous for, our interdisciplinarity, and, and which also allows us to seek multifaceted uh, uh, responses to research as well as the societal problems that we encounter. Now, in uh, thinking about the new initiatives that we wanted to go into, I, I really set us, uh, we worked with the deans to uh, uh, try and leverage our limited resources because as you know, this our state uh, uh, funding for our university is declining. And so we really wanted to get away from silos and combine our strengths and build on a nucleus of faculty that really provides uh, outstanding uh, strengths. And what we've asked then in the strategic planning is to base this on the following principles. We know that we are getting close to steady state. We were growing for a number of years. And by steady state, we really mean at, at the level of the undergraduate population, we are already where the master plan wanted us to be in 2020. So we have uh, uh, grown and we've reached steady state as far as the master plan is concerned, which really implies that if we are going to be a cutting edge university, we must repurpose what we do, that we've got to give up something in order to do the blue sky thinking and get into areas that we really think can impact the world. So in order to maintain our preeminence, then we must constantly renew, our, uh, renew ourselves to stay at the forefront of research. Now in doing the strategic planning, our selection criteria that I imposed were the following. First, that they must give UC San Diego a unique and competitive advantage, that they must be interdisciplinary and cut across divisions and departments, and third, and most importantly, they must have societal impact. So we're still in the early stages of this planning process <clears throat> with respect to these new initiatives, but we do anticipate that with each initiative, we will build on the strengths that UC San Diego is so famous for, <clears throat> and this will put us on the map with respect to these areas in the next decade. We also anticipate a variety of targeted investments that are going to be required, and what I've really asked the faculty to do is to think of a three-year plan whereby I've, on the general campus, we have put out 125 to 130 new faculty positions in the next three years. This allows us to plan for steady state, but at the same time, I've asked the deans to invest at least 25 to 30 percent of these uh, 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 faculty positions into new areas that we can call uh, 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 new forays into areas of research, and these are the ones that you will hear about this particular evening. Furthermore, because elements of these targeted research initiatives really dovetail with research that is going on in the health sciences as well as SIO, it provides us with an opportunity to bring all of these units together so that this campus is a single entity that presents itself to the outside world and impacts the quality of life for the rest of the people, not only locally but also nationally and globally. Now, of course, we are ultimately an educational institution in addition to our research and service. And so I do want to say a few words about uh, the education initiative that we've also undertaken, which you won't hear about today, but I hope we'll have a chance to, to talk about that a little bit more uh, at a future occasion. This new educational vision will really <clears throat> position UC San Diego as a national model for its excellence in undergraduate and graduate ed education, and will be a driver for sustainable innovation in, in, in teaching and learning. We hope that we can focus our 
uh, teaching or education, not just on what we want to teach, but knowledge about what uh, students want to learn and how they learn based on our understanding of cognitive science and hum human behavior and so on. So this will real and also this will be combined with the latest use of technology, which is, which is exemplified so well by this particular room that you're sitting in. This fall, we welcomed over 6,000 extraordinary students. These are both freshmen and transfer students. And th these were selected out of a total of about 70,000 uh, students. So this makes us the fifth most popular university in the nation. Uh, and, and students still want to keep coming here despite the fact that fees are going up and the state economy uh, is, is not being very supportive with respect to support for the university. So I really look forward to the bright future that, uh, that, that these students uh, and, expect, and in delivering the expectations that these students have of us. And um, Armin Afsahi, who is here, uh, asked the students to write down what it is that uh, their aspirations were for the university. And it's just inspiring to see what the students want of the university. And a lot of it is indeed the theme that we focus on that is giving back to society. So we hope that we'll really be able to teach them what they want to learn, but also be able to uh, transform them into citizens who can go out into the world and have a serious impact. So with this, I'd like to really get on with the program. And we have four of our distinguished faculty leaders who uh, talk to us today. And I want to start with the introduction of the first um, theme, quantitative and systems biology. And I'd like to do this by introducing our deans, Steve Kay and Mark Thiemens. Steve Kay is the dean and Richard C. Atkinson chair in the Division of Biological Sciences. He's also a distinguished professor of cell and developmental biology. Mark Thiemens is the dean uh, for, in the Division of Physical Sciences and the Chancellor's Associates Chair uh, and Distinguished Professor of Chemistry and Biochemistry. By the way, both of these uh, deans are members of the National Academy of Sciences. Their presentation will focus on the first theme, uh, that is quantitative and systems biology, which, whose goal it is to take, transform biology from a descriptive science into a predictive science. And they hope to do this with their faculty using a combination of advanced mathematical modeling as well as quantitative uh, experimentation to understand these uh, biological systems in terms of their predictive uh, pr properties. It will allow us to really transition from a, what's called a parts list of all the things that exist in biological systems which have come from the Human Genome Project or other genome projects to getting an understanding of biological networks how they work, and how to tweak them to make them do what we want them to do. And in this sense, it is uh, uh, the predictive understanding that is so important uh, in, in uh, uh, getting there. And in effect, it is taking us from a descriptive parts list to an owner's manu manual for biological systems. We hope also that with this understanding of biological systems and how they work, we will ab be able to, to transform these organisms to help mankind and society. And you will hear some aspects of this uh, uh, from, uh, from uh, these two deans. Quantitative biology is recognized as providing the basic science anchor and a catalyst for future applications in personalized medicine. And we hope also that this will transform diagnostic and human therapeutics. So with this, I please join me in welcoming uh, Deans Kay and Thiemens. I think Steve will go first, followed by Mark. Over the next few hours, um, what we'd like to describe to you is really a revolution that is occurring in the scientific community. And this revolution has been enabled by a new view of biological systems that can be applied to, as I'm going to tell you, many grand challenges that our, face, that our planet faces. But the key is, is that biologists alone cannot solve these problems. We're going to have to work very closely with the physicists, the chemists, the engineers, the mathematicians, in order for us to be able to really grapple with some of the biggest problems that our planet are facing and in a timely manner come up with real life solutions to these challenges. So I think many of you are familiar with the fact that uh, somewhere uh, about a month or so ago, the seventh billion person was born, possibly in India. And with that, of course, comes a number of challenges that are facing our planet. By 2030, there'll be 8 billion people, and by 2050, there's going to be 9 billion. And associated with that growth in human population 
with the aging of that population in some areas of the planet, socioeconomic situations with a rapidly growing population in the developing world, together with things like climate change, produce almost a perfect storm in presenting grand challenges that it is our responsibility in the scientific community not only to measure, and UCSD has really led the charge in measuring many of these challenges, but to provide effective solutions to society. So basically what we are learning recently in terms of measuring these challenges is basically a billion people are undernourished right now, particularly in areas where the food supply is already stressed. Human activities, of course, are destroying ecosystems and in fact changing our climate. This is presenting a challenge on a global level. Transportation fuels, for example, the whole energy question in general, which we're gonna hear from my colleague George Tynan later, is, is on a course that is contributing to this kind of environmental destruction, and we need new types of technologies for, for energy to come from non-renewable resources. And as Suresh said, a key challenge in medicine, which our colleagues in health sciences and, and things like the Institute in Engineering and Medicine is, medicine is transforming quickly from treating populations of people in a statistical way to figuring out what the precise disease mechanisms are that have occurred in an individual patient and bringing about personal health care. So we have global demands. We have demands that will be placed on water supply, food supply, energy supply. What are we going to do? Are we gonna hang our heads and give up? Or are you gonna use the same type of innovation that we've used to measure the scale of these problems with providing these solutions? So what we're talking about tonight in discussing quantitative and systems biology, and I'll tell you a little bit what that means, is really a new biology for the 21st century. And this new biology has been heralded really by the genome sequencing area. When we sequence the genome of a human, it initially began with the sequence of Craig Venter, but now many humans have been sequenced, we find that humans have about 20,000 genes. So all of a sudden our graduate students and our undergrads are not learning just about one gene or two genes working together in a cell. They have to get used to the idea of listening to the orchestra that is the music of life that occurs inside of these cells and the idea that they can have a parts list for the human body, a parts list for creating a new, uh, a new crop plant. That's what genome sequencing gives us, a parts list. But in order to fix that body, in order to make that better crop plant, we need to move from a parts list to an instruction manual. And so there are three distinct dis disciplines that are being merged together across our campus to provide the instruction manual for medicine, the instruction manual for creating new, uh, new types of food and the food supply, the instruction manual for renewable energy sources. One is systems biology. Simply put, systems biology is the idea that we're not going to study the action of genes in one or two at a time. We're going to study them 10,000 at a time, 20,000 at a time, 100,000 at a time. Synthetic biology is the new field in which we're going to learn from the evolved networks that we measure inside our cells and learn how to build new types of cells that become new diagnostics, that become new types of plants that can be grown in stressed environments. So synthetic biology is, is creating life from the components that sequencing gives us. And quantitative biology is, is really the core of this revolution. Quantitative biology is saying, we are measuring so many things, we have so much data, we need to become predictive about medicine predictive about agriculture, where we can model these networks inside of cells and predict how that particular network, the human body in a disease situation, a crop in a stress situation will behave. And we'll do that using the tools that have generally come from physics and mathematics and engineering. So biologists are collecting a lot of data. And one of the reasons they're collecting a lot of data is our grad students look a lot different these days. They all wear very uniform types of clothes, they absolutely don't sleep, they don't eat very much, and they work about 24 hours around the clock. Automation has completely changed the way in which we collect data, and a modern biology lab will basically be collecting millions of data points 
in a day. It's, it's, it's basically transformed the way in which we can get a view of life because of this very high-level type of automation in which we can apply to measuring processes that occur inside of cells. And so when we take that data and reconstruct it, we get a frighteningly complex view of these networks inside of cells. And you'll hear from Peter Cowie later on how similar types of networks, of course, exist in social interactions. And in fact, much of the same theory and analysis of these types of biological networks that relate to disease in humans or creating cr crop plants in agriculture, much of the type of application to understand how these genes relate to each other in a network, both in health and disease, are similar to the same kind of problems we need to study in social networks and, and uh, sociology. But biologists shouldn't be too frightened by this type of com complexity because we're familiar with it. If we think about a common or garden car or a PC, we're pretty used to these types of wiring diagrams because in a bottom-up fashion, Engineers have designed these instruments basically from these wiring diagrams to create these instruments. So we can learn from those types of tools that come from mathematics and engineering and apply those types of tools to not only understanding the complexity of how cells work, but indeed building new types of cellular devices with good applications. And this is what I would call a bottom-up method. Physicists have, can bring different types of expertise in a top-down way. The way that we're learning about galaxies and stars is that we collect lots and lots of data and, and we learn by implication how these star systems are structured by analyzing this data. So either in a bottom-up way or a top-down way, we can become predictive in biology and learn from our colleagues in engineering, physics, and mathematics. So here's a quick example of what's going on in this campus right now. You guys will all be familiar with this equation that describes the dynamics of gene expression, handing out a test at the intermission. And what colleagues um, have done, and this is in the lab of Jeff Hasty, who is a joint faculty member between engineering and biology. Jeff has basically used these equations to tell him how to design circuits inside of cells. And so don't worry about what all of this means. He's designing cellular circuitry de novo in his lab using the tools of synthetic biology. And when he puts a little glow-in-the-dark gene inside of these cells, the same glow-in-the-dark gene that one of our faculty, Roger Chen, won the Nobel Prize for a few years ago, what he can see is he's creating new types of behavior in these cells, new circuits, new switches, new types of capacitors. And what we're learning from these types of experiments is a multitude of things. Similar approaches in my own lab have been telling us about new ways to treat diabetes. Using these this type of circuitry and recreating the circuitry in naive organisms is, for example, helping my lab collaborate with the dean of the medical school, David Brenner, to come up with a new treatment for diabetes. Here, Jeff is using it in bacteria to create new types of circuitry and signaling. And what you can see here is he produces inside of these cells brand new types of switches and oscillations that tell us a lot about how cells are wired, but also tell us how we can capture these types of new behaviors and apply them in novel ways. So for example, Jeff Hastie's lab is creating new types of biosensors using these novel synthetic biology circuits, combining his biological expertise the parts lists that come from genome sequencing with his physics and engineering background to create things like new types of handheld biosensors that are going to be useful for all kinds of environmental science, medical devices, and things like that. So this is the picture that the National Academy of Sciences is producing for what this new biology is. This new biology is, is, is about a biology-based solutions to societal problems in all of these areas we've talked about, but it's going to require integration. And here lies the strength of UCSD. Our strength is our youth. Engineering, physics, biology, health sciences, SIO, um, and, and the, uh, the other schools throughout campus all work together very closely. And this is a strength that we're going to leverage in creating this new kind of effort to produce real solutions in a timely manner 
to some of the biggest problems that, that our global community is facing. And so with that, and with, you can see that Dr. Hastie has trained his bacteria to send a message to us. With that, as I said, I would like to introduce to you a genuine rocket scientist, my good colleague, Dean Mark Tiemens. First of all, I'd like, um, welcome to everyone. It's, it's nice to see all of you here and have a chance to speak with you about the things that we have planning. I have to apologize ahead of time when they asked me to speak. I thought they said I should speak about Area 51, and I was going to tell you about my work in the Nevada desert in Roswell, New Mexico. But I've hastily put together this talk about our aspects of quantitative biology and how we look at what the future is going to be on this. If we look back at revolution scientifically, going back to the re Industrial Revolution, it starts with the invention of the steam engine. But what really made this go is the ability to model and understand at the basic level how does heat transfer or the field of thermodynamics. And so that interplay between the development of the new technology, in this case the steam engine, and the thermodynamic development simultaneously accelerated the discovery of, of, of uh, the steam engine and catalyzed the revolution. If you move into the 20th century, everyone knows that in the beginning of the 20th century was the advent of quantum mechanics. Classical mechanics describes things that are small and fast. Okay? And that theoretically different from Newtonian physics where things are large and classical. So when we entered the world of the quanta and relativity, we described a whole new universe. And with that came the things that we now know in information technology and satellite technology, storage of new materials, nanotechnology, everything changed. And that led down to the nuclear level and eventually into the world of, of where we are now with nuclear technology and nuclear energy. Now, what's interesting in what we're talking about now is a prediction. What's the next revolution going to be? And we don't want to be part of it, we want to lead it. So that's the trick. That's what we're talking about. That's what Steve is just saying, is that how do you predict the future? How do we guide the future how do we assemble the team here that's going to do this? And that's what we're trying to do here. A former member and, and president of the National Academy, Philip Abelson, wrote a paper some years back where he basically said that the future of science is going to be, the next future is going to be in biology. And the future of biology may not be totally in biology, but rather the convergence, physics, mathematics, quantitative sciences and biology together. 10 years ago, I mean, when I was, I was beginning as a dean and having discussions about this, it was probably premature to start saying things like this. I don't think that it was ready at the time for a lot of reasons, but now things have come together. Steve's already showed you the amazing things that are going on. You can measure things now that you couldn't measure before, smaller, faster, and more. The level of data that Steve was talking about, instead of making five or 10 measurements overnight and plotting it on a piece of graph paper, it's now millions of data points. How do you deal with levels of complexities? As he said, going into the political area, the societal area, how do you model such things? Where do the tools come from to do that when you have that sort of data set? And so if you take it at the level of, of for example, the robotics that Steve just showed you, Assembling all this data, I, I would call this wet biology in a classical way. Assembling data, amassing this data. The next part of it then is that one gets more and more progressively smaller, faster, and easier that you can get this kind of data sets where you deal with the real property, properties of what's happening in a system, in the circuit of the biology. Very small, very complex. So that now one can do the theoretical analysis of this. Now you need to be able to handle data sets of this complexity. But where do you find people that handle data, set, data sets of this complexity? Where do they hang out? So who are these people? So right now, if you want to go find a set of people that do these sort of things, you go to Switzerland. And they're all sitting in a cave over there called the CERN, which is a nuclear reactor, as, as, as a particle accelerator, where they're searching for the Higgs, the holy grail of physics find the Higgs vector boson. If you want to understand the grand unification of all of matter, that's where it lies. If it exists, 
the theories are right. If they're wrong, everyone starts over again. You have to find the Higgs. Well, what is this Higgs? It's an elusive particle that may exist, that may not exist, and you can only find it at the higher energies where you slam two particles beams head on and you look at a fragment of one times 10 to the 18th particles coming around, coming apart from each other and finding the one piece of evidence in all that stuff. That's the search for the Higgs. That's the kind of complexities that Steve was talking about. That's what you have to look for. That's what you have to analyze. That's what you have to sort through. So that's the kind of people that do those sort of things. In the world of astrophysics, the people that are looking for cold, dark matter are searching for things such as um, interactions between galaxies with massive collections of star populations. These are the kind of people that handle massive sets of data to try to understand them in three dimensions and uh, time. So now what you've heard Steve describe, those are the areas that are coming together. If you now then, well, how do you do that? Give me an example of this. So one of the fun parts of the, of the, of the job, and you know, there's, Steve will tell you and, and my other colleagues that there's two lists in a dean's job of good things and bad things, and one of the lists is much longer than the other, um, and you can figure out which one's which. And the good list is that you get to talk to a lot of really interesting colleagues. So I talk to some of my friends that do what one would say is quantitative biology, but didn't have a background in biology. Uh, one of them in physics and one of them in mathematics. The one I spoke to in mathematics studies relativity. He's, a, he's what the mathematicians refer to as an applied mathematician because he does something so pedestrian as special in general relativity. And he uses tools to understand singularities in a space-time continuum. Actually, that's a good description how I often feel. Just when I come in, I feel like a singularity in a space-time continuum. And it's, and it's a space where the fabric is a singularity and it no longer continuously blends out in space and time. And, and that's what a black hole is. I mean, and, and if you've ever seen one, you, need, you know that you have to be careful around them. They're highly dangerous. And one of the tricks in relativity is that one has to map these. And when you map the space-time continuum, it takes special mathematical tricks. It's a trick called meshing. It lets you look at things in three dimensions that are having multiple planes. And so what he's done is when he wants to understand a complicated molecule, the people that live in buildings like this, what they really want to understand is the three-dimensional structure and at really high resolution. And right now, some of those details you can't measure, so you need to model it, and you need to understand it. And most tricks in doing it give you a fuzzy picture of it. But using the meshing trick that he actually uses in relativity works on understanding the molecules in three dimensions. So it's a trick that you learn in special relativity, but it's applied to understanding what a molecule does so that you can understand what the medical application is in it. So that, to me, is, is it's, a, it's not a simple example, but a good example of how it comes together. So the, the concluding comments to say in that, so this is my spectral slide that shows that when you take any given spectrum, you can split it apart into different pieces, but they all go back together again. And, and the idea is, can you split the spectrum apart, understand it, and put it back together and lead to making big discoveries? So what we're doing here, what the future is, I once asked Roger Revelle about starting the university, and he was talking about how he did it. And what he said was, you know, Mark, sometimes I felt like the Grim Reaper because people knew that when I appeared on their campus, their best faculty were going to disappear and they were going to end up in La Jolla. And, and we're running an experiment now. And to a certain extent, it's like Ro what Roger did. It was a risk. Our thought is that the future is going to be in this convergence of areas. And we're running this experiments at all levels, the faculty are telling us what the future is going to be. The faculty are working together and interacting at that level. They're telling us what they think is going to be the level. And Steve and I and the other leaders at the university are working with Suresh and the chancellor to do this. And so that's what our booking is going to be on the future. And we're integrating our searches now in a way that we've never done before. 31, 51 years here at Area 51, um, of putting these things together 
We've never run searches like this. And people around the country are noticing this. They're saying something is going on. It's exactly what Roger said when he was putting it together. People knew something was going on. Their faculty were disappearing and going to La Jolla. People were whispering in the night about this. What, what are they doing out there? That's what we're trying to do now. And we wanted to share it with you tonight, what's going on here. So thank you for coming and listening. So I'd like to move on then to our uh, second uh, theme for focus today. And this is the design initiative. And the person who will do the introduction of the design initiative will give you a flavor of what design can mean in the context of uh, social sciences is uh, Dean Peter Cowie, who is in the School of International Relations and Pacific Studies. And he currently holds a Qualcomm Endowed Chair in uh, Communication and Te Technology Policy. Dean Cowie's lecture will focus on one example of what we mean by design, an initiative that, was, uh, that, uh, uh, that aims to establish a new structure uh, for policy design and, and, uh, and uh, evaluation using lab approaches. And this is an approach that he calls policy design and evaluation laboratories to really integrate what we know about economics, political science, and other social science disciplines to provide novel solutions to very important policy issues regarding the global problems. You will see some very exciting examples of how we at UCSD are using data collection, evaluation, analysis to do field experiments and then to drive policy and to do this in an iterative way so that we're learning from each round of uh, iteration to develop better policies that work in real life. And what this really means is a fundamental change in which we are moving away in social sciences from theory and ideology to doing real-time experiments. And that informs the public then of exactly what policy changes are. So these are policies driven by real-life experience out there in the field. And, because, and you'll begin to see the connections with what Steve uh, Kay talked about, experiments, data collection, analysis, iteration and, and then going on to develop better policies. I also want to say a few words about design. Most of you think of design in the concept as a very interactive, interdisciplinary and creative activity that is often fo focused on providing functional practical solutions to uh, typically aimed at products or, or objects. But we want to expand this concept of design to include much more than just these uh, uh, specific things. You can think of design as including processes, institutional structures, uh, services, or even our own interactive environment to maximize the human experience and potential to really have societal impact. So design in this view can be informed by research on cognition and perception, communication, as well as by art, history, theater, operations research, and even management principles. And so I'd like you to welcome uh, uh, Peter uh, Kawi to come up to the podium and talk about one aspect of this design initiative. Thanks very much, Zoresh, and thank you all for joining us tonight. I'm going to do two things. The first uh, is to walk you briefly uh, through the bigger picture about design so that you get a sense of what the broader conversation involving the arts and humanities, the social sciences, engineering and the sciences, and uh, the Rady School and my School of International Relations and Pacific Studies is about at that very broad level of design. And then I'm going to take you to the specific area of policy design and evaluation to illustrate some of the things that we hope that we can do in this transformational work at UC San Diego. So what is design? Uh, well, the paradigmatic design of the 21st century so far is the iPad. Right, And in some ways, if a design initiative simply made UCSD more likely to produce slick hardware and applications that were like the iPad, that would be a lot. But really, design is about a set of principles. And the first is to imagine the possibilities of transforming our physical or human environment. And imagination is not just wild brainstorming. It's a disciplined form of imagining that breaks the barriers of our conventional work to start opening us to possibilities. And then we prototype solutions. We think about what would this look like as a solution? And if you read the new biography of Steve Jobs, you knew that the next step was iteration. 
iteration, iteration, iteration to make sure that the solution really turned into something that made sense. And then a type of ruthless evaluation of what had been achieved at that point. Those principles of design then cover many areas, not just building iPads. So here's one example of design in the arts, a stage set and lighting. It's a product of our own theater uh, arts program, which has a design master's degree. And they have a set of intellectual disciplines on how to comment on the text of a play to imagine how to imagine a setting that doesn't literally replicate that world of the play, but creates a moment of imagination for us to share that effectively works for the space of the play. And beyond that traditional form of design in the arts, at UC San Diego, we've seen enormous advances in thinking about how other forms of the sciences can interact with the arts. Here is one of the iconic uh, paintings of the 20th century, Picasso's Gertrude Stein portrait. The New York City Ballet reinvented the space of dance and the design of dance space. But at UCSD in cognitive and neurosciences, we've added to that brain imaging in order to be able to see where the brain responds and how to those artistic expressions. And from that has come a new discipline of neuroaesthetics and design, in which literally we start to ask, how is it that the wiring of the brain, those networks that are in the human brain, come together and respond to various artistic expressions, and why some expressions seem to have enduring, powerful effects because of their interaction with our basic cognitive structure. And so we both are creating new tools to understand the artistic experience, but we're also from that getting new analytics for both stretching our imagination about how to do the design of arts and dance, but also at the same time learning from those artistic undertakings about the way our brain works. Now, another form of design is involving social networks, and this is what Steve Kay talked about a little bit earlier. I'm gonna show you uh, a type of design problem that is really tied to what we think of as social networking. And what has occurred is that the exact same images that you are seeing with Steve about networks in human biology are being developed and examined with many of the same laws, as Steve said, like power laws, in order to understand how social patterns emerge and sh can be shaped. This is a picture of a simple form of a social network. Several people, the person in orange in the center is exemplifying the power of being in between. That person is literally the person most connected to everybody else as a central player, and that gives that person certain types of influence in the social network. Now, when you read the conventional social science about how society works, the typical type of statistical study goes like this. They look at the attributes of people who are interesting, like Mark, right? Mark is a rocket scientist, expert on Area 51, a really rich dean who's well paid, fancy sports car, right? <laughs> right? All those things. And then they take a look at the attributes of me, not so well paid, really boring, and you know, is jet lag most of the time from getting off a plane. And from that, in running large numbers, we start to get from the attributes of individuals, relationships that we look for to try to discover things like propensity to consume various types of goods and services, or the level of investment in an economy. Well, what this type of analysis is doing is going the exact opposite way. It's saying that the relationship structure itself that is powering what's happening, not the interaction of the attributes of the individuals. So this is a picture of network in which over a number of years, thousands of people were observed regularly on a quarterly basis. And if I could show you the full time series, what you would see is that happiness was networked. 
And because of the particular structure of this network, it was susceptible to if one small subgroup became happy, it radiated through the network. There are other types of network structures where that radiation would not have taken place. So in looking in the structure of the network, we can start to discover how social behavior and attitudes start to manifest themselves from the small, you and me and a few of our friends, to the large over time. And we can start to ask the question, how can we do interventions? This work, for example, is suggesting new directions in public health intervention. Well, there are some areas that call for redesign. So here's a picture uh, in the center of the office buildings of downtown Atlanta. Very typical of downtown Atlanta. It uses a lot of buildings that are out of the tall, shiny building school of building, which is to say reflective materials. Also, for all of you who are familiar with Atlanta, Atlanta is an extremely spread out metropolitan area. On the left, you see a comparison of the metropolitan area of Atlanta with the metropolitan area of Barcelona, Spain. They have the exact same population, 2.8 million people, but in that density factor, you have built into it a large amount of commuting, use of energy, and a whole series of other byproducts that we can think of. This is a heat imaging of Atlanta, and basically what it tells you is Atlanta is a hot spot, right? And all those building materials, that spread out population and a whole series of other patterns in Atlanta make it an energy sink of the worst sort, throwing off huge amounts of heat. We know that one of the challenges we are going to be facing in the world of environmental change that is going to come is going to be dealing with the major generators of heat in the world, urban areas. So the question that we can ask ourselves in design is are there ways that A, we can use our skills in engineering to change the engineering solutions to a more friendly pattern, but two, can we do societal design? Can we take that network that I showed you in the last slide and instead of dealing with happiness, start thinking about things that tip behavior, not by government mandate and orders, but by networking attitudes and beliefs to move to, let's say, denser urban build-in, and therefore less sprawl and commuting, and less heat throw off. So what I've done so far is take you through the notion that there is a world out there of design that takes itself from the ranges that we think of traditionally of designing objects, design in the arts, and then starting to understand that these same notions of opening ourselves up to imagination, starting to prototype solutions, Think of the right network structure, for example, and then starting to iterate ways of picturing how you might intervene in that can open ourselves to new possibilities for serving society or advancing the arts and natural sciences. And so the design initiative in its broadest sense will launch a very broad interdisciplinary conversation built around problems rather than uh, disciplinary silos and it's going to bring design into the classroom. And I want to stress this because one thing that we all agree about in this further development of UCSD is that teaching is, in a sense, prototyping the solutions of the tomorrow. It's where we come together as faculty and work together as teams, testing out ideas and refining them in a conversation with our students who in the long term will the people who will really come up with the solutions. And so this is very much deeply an educational project. And in the design initiative, it will lead to new types of studios, policy labs, and experiments, and new types of engagements with the broader community to do design. The big uh, area that we've uh, been spending time on in uh, my area of the social sciences is on what we call policy design and evaluation laboratories. Now, uh, I'm the dean of a school of international relations and Pacific studies, so you might think I have a propensity for long-winded titles for whatever uh, uh, I help design, but we call these policy labs to be short. But the principles of design and evaluation are core to what we're thinking about here. Basically what is occurring in the cutting edge of social science, 
and in many of the faculty members work here at UCSD is a shift from these broad categories of what are almost ideologies. I'm a free marketer, I'm a Keynesian, I'm a this or I'm a that, to a much more nuanced, data-driven, experimental view of how to diagnose and solve problems. And so this intellectual development is driven by also by the confluence with the emergence of new centers of power and thought around the world, places like India and China, who aren't convinced that the traditional schools of thought and policy analysis that came out of our experience actually answer the types of questions that they debate, such as how do we reduce poverty? How do we strengthen freedom in various ways? Or how do we understand the consequences of globalization? And so this design initiative is to really build new analytic tools and test smart ideas in the real world. Let me give you a pair of examples in addressing the issue of reducing poverty. First, on public health and economic growth. We all know that disease, besides being an enormous tragedy for the individuals involved, also represents a huge challenge for uh, economic growth because it diverts resources and people. This is a picture of an HIV uh, health uh, campaign in Malawi. It's a typical large-scale public health campaign to try to get people to use condoms. This is a picture of Malawi in the level of HIV AIDS in Malawi. It is basically one of the highest uh, infection rates in the world, despite all of the signs on the left. Professor Craig McIntosh on our faculty was out evaluating the effects of various public health campaigns to reduce HIV and AIDS. And he showed some positive results, but much less than people hoped when things were properly evaluated. But he also noticed from the data that they could pinpoint the big edge where they could cut into the problem, which is in young women who are leaving school at an early age and were essentially without economic resources and tended to become uh, engaged uh, through marriage and else, elsewhere with itinerant uh, commercial people, especially truckers, who are one of the biggest transmission belts for HIV AIDS in Africa. And so Craig came up with an idea, a prototype, which they tested, and it was this. Let's pay the families a small stipend to keep the girls in school and let's see what happens. And they did, and that cash supplement has kept the girls in school for a much longer period of time, and the rate of early marriage and pregnancy has dropped 30 to 40% in the test population, and with it, the HIV AIDS rate of infection has plummeted as well. Here's another example. We think of India as a place of great uh, engineers, but the rural level of illiteracy is 50%. Why is that? There are still schools out in rural India. It's not an absence of schools. Well, one of our researchers spent a lot of time looking at the data and discovered, as he tested and evaluated, that 25% of the teachers in rural India don't ever show up at the school to teach. So what he did was start to ask, what would cause these teachers to show up? Because they didn't pay any attention to the orders and the rules. And so, through a series of experiments on what they would respond to, he found out that if you pay teachers based on student performance, introduce an evaluation system that you do control, and you have modest teacher bonuses, it will lead to large improvements in school performance. Let me take two other examples on expanding freedom. Honest elections in developing countries, a big challenge. Jimmy Carter became famous for his election monitoring efforts. Here's a picture in Uganda of a recent election. Election monitoring didn't actually work that well because it was all done with paper for all those people who have weak paper trails and involved tons of paper in really distributed small villages. So Clark Gibson of our political science department got together with Qualcomm and invented a new technique using mobile phones to do election monitoring, turning it into an observational system that worked much more effectively, and with the data, they actually figured out which areas were most likely to have fraud and where to spend the most time monitoring. 
The result is that they have been showing that they are reducing voting fraud in these elections by 50%. Here's another thing that we say when we go to developing countries. Rule of law, rule of law, what's the first step? Make things more transparent. Let people see government in action. So Professor Eddie Molesky here at UCSD talked the Vietnamese Communist Party into letting him run an experiment in which members of the National Assembly of Vietnam would be told in experimental control groups which ones were going to be more on the major website in Vietnam and which would be less. Here's a picture of them and of some of the information that they were dealing with. What happened with the legislators who were more on the website, therefore subject to more transparency? This is the response rate of criticism. And what the graph basically shows you is the more exposure the legislator had on the web, the less he criticized the government. The exact opposite of everything we thought. Finally, globalization. I just want to simply point out that globalization, you get these debates about whether it's good or bad. The point about globalization is it breaks the box of our traditional categories. So this is something that Gordon Hansen uh, of our faculty has done in a massive data analysis uh, with his colleagues at MIT. It's a picture of the US response to trade with China. And the takeaway from this is pretty simple. We think of trade with China as the things that put textile workers out of business or most affects places like Detroit. But what they show is that the biggest impacts are in Silicon Valley and the research triangle, not in Detroit. But until you did a whole new form of data analysis, you couldn't find the effect. So what the policy labs are going to do is break us out of silos. They're going to develop new data analytics, and they're going to allow us to scale up from a few thousand people in a rural area to dealing with experiments with healthcare systems over the millions. And to be able to do that, we're going to have to combine powerful computational techniques with experiments on the ground and a whole new way of working with our students to engage them as our partners in doing this. And finally, it will require a set of funding partners out there in the world who uh, will engage with us because they have problems they want to solve, and we have ways of breaking through the traditional debates to get a new perspective and handle on how to intervene in the world. That's what we have one of the largest cadres of social scientists in the United States ready to do together. Uh, this has brought them to think of ways of experimenting with each other already that they had never thought of before, and it's one of our bets on the future. Thanks very much. I'd like to move um, uh, next to our final uh, sh showcase uh, this evening, and this is the Advanced Energy Initiative. Uh, I should remind you that uh, we have the largest school of engineering in, in, in California, and George Tynan, who is an Associate Vice Chancellor for Research, and a professor of mechanical engineering and aerospace engineering will uh, do this presentation. His presentation will focus on a new energy initiative. And I'll, just as a perspective, I should remind you that you know, today 85% of our energy uh, comes from fossil fuels. And it is quite clear that in the next 50 years or so, this is an unsustainable approach and the sole reliance, uh, whichever way you look at it. You can look at it economically, geopolitically, environmentally, or even from a social justice perspective, there just simply isn't enough fossil fuel to go around uh, with respect to our consumption. So this is all about changing expectations and behaviors, as well as trying to develop alternative technologies to wean ourselves away from this reliance on fossil fuel and develop alternative energies. And UC San Diego is exceptionally unique in having not only a, 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 a large number of faculty who focus on this area, but with our campus and the microgrid that we have for power, where 85% of our, the campus power can come from our own generation of energy, this university is a living test bed, a living laboratory, where we have certain buildings where almost every plug point is wired, and we can tell you 724 who's coming and when the lights are going on, who's sleeping at work, and so on. So uh, this is the kind of uh, uh, unique test bed that just doesn't exist anywhere else in the country, and this allows us to, to do experiments in this area uh, while really testing out the technologies. 
We believe then that there are real opportunities for this campus to lead the establishment of a new liquid fuel industry based right here in Southern California and perhaps also in Northern California. And this also impacts uh, uh, things in the biological arena uh, on the development of algal biofuels. UC San Diego has made important advances in solar energy and lighting. And uh, several cities in San Diego County have already benefited, benefited from the work of our faculty colleagues in the Jacobs School of Engineering and also in partnering with Clean Tech San Diego to really completely reinvent the way lighting is provided in streets and public uh, spaces. So please welcome George Tynan, who will describe our existing and potential new endeavors in this very important field of research. Thank you, Suresh, and uh, thank you for the time that you've uh, taken this evening uh, to hear all of the talks. It's my pleasure to give uh, this talk on behalf of many colleagues who have interests in this general area. I think, as you'll see, this is not only an engineering problem, but a, a science problem, a social sciences problem, a uh, policy, economics. It, it cuts across what we do here at UC San Diego. Uh, our founder, or at least one of the founders, uh, Roger Revelle, had a strong interest in the issue of energy, and so I would say that energy is sort of woven into the intellectual DNA, I stole a phrase from Mark Tiemens, um, uh, from the very beginning of this institution. And the phrase I focus on is this quote at the end of his paper uh, in the mid-70s, uh, where he's studying energy in the uh, Indian agricultural system. He says, the discovery of ways to use less expensive forms of energy than human muscle made it possible for men to be free. And Ravel, when you read the paper, you see that he's not only talking about uh, uh, political freedom from oppression, but he's really speaking about positive freedom. That is, giving people the time uh, and ability to focus their uh, efforts in other things besides growing their own food and trying simply to survive. Scale is really important in the energy problem, and so I want to take a moment and just sort of give us a, an orders of magnitude sense here. A typical uh, compact fluorescent light bulb shown on the left will use maybe 10 watts or so of electrical power. That is the rate of energy consumption. A toaster, maybe 1,000 watts, so a hair dryer around 1,000 watts. The energy power equivalent of, say, an engine in a small aircraft, around a million watts. Uh, a large uh, centralized power plant, like a nuclear power station or coal-fired power plant, is around a, a gigawatt, that is a billion watts. Worldwide energy demand today, or power demand rather, distributed over all types of energy, that is fuels, electricity, heat, and so forth, is about 14 trillion watts of power. That's roughly equal, we're in rough numbers, to around 14,000 nuclear power stations or large coal-fired power plants. Around 20,000 barrels of oil per second burned. 14 million large wind, wind turbines that would be distributed over roughly 20 uh, million square kilometers of land. Uh, that's roughly continental scale. Um, or 40,000 square miles of photovoltaic cells, which would take us 1,000 years to build at today's production rates. That is what we do today. Energy is, uh, has profound impacts on how people live their lives. This is a plot taken from UN data uh, uh, showing on the vertical axis child mortality rate, and what that means is how many children die before they reach their fifth birthday, okay? And so the uh, data points in the upper left uh, up here is 20% of the children die before reaching the age of five. This is a log plot, so here's 2%, here's 0.2%, and so forth. This is out of 1,000 live births per year. And the horizontal axis is the aver average annual uh, energy access uh, per capita in different uh, regions of the world, so you can see the color coding of the geographic areas. And what I did was I highlighted a number of countries. Bangladesh is the blue, green is, uh, I believe, Egypt, uh, red is China, and Brazil uh, would be the yellow data. And this is data from the 19, about 1970 until about two years ago when the data stopped. And you can see this clear progression sort of from this regime of um, low energy access, very high child mortality, down to uh, a much what I would call a much better quality of life for these children. Energy is not causal here, it's correlative, but it's a marker. It shows you the impact of having access to energy on how people live their lives. You can show many, many such uh, social measures of uh, quality of life. And so as a consequence, uh, there's a strong motivation 
to have access to at least some minimally acceptable amount of energy. As was pointed out, uh, I think, in Peter's talk, fossil fuels uh, provide more than 80% of our current energy usage today, uh, mostly by burning uh, petroleum or coal or natural gas, but they are a finite resource, and we can illustrate this by looking in history. This is a plot of the annual production rate of coal in Great Britain, going back over 200 years. And you can see the sort of, the sort of beginning of a ramp up, uh, a peak set around the time of World War I, goes through some little wiggles here and there uh, uh, up until about World War II, and then began this inexorable decline. And it is inevitable, it's only a matter of time before the same thing happens to all other fossil fuel energy sources on a global scale, not simply in the UK. UCSD also has another strong legacy in addition to Roger Revelle and uh, the founders of the university in this issue in the form of the legacy of Charles Keeling and others, his colleagues at SIO and in uh, uh, general campus in the physical sciences. Uh, this is a plot of, this is called the Keeling curve. This is carbon dioxide concentration in the atmosphere for the last thousand years. And you can see that for about a thousand years, a millennia, it's sort of humming along roughly constant with some small bumps and wiggles in it. And then about here, something happens, and Mark alluded to this in his talk. This is the invention of the steam engine, and actually in 1769, and then by the 1800s, it was perfected and began to propagate, first in the UK, and then into Europe and North America, and so forth. And that allowed human beings, for the first time, to take stored energy from the form of heat and turn it into useful work, and that changed everything. But one of the things that also changes is CO2 emission into the atmosphere because it is inherent when you burn fossil fuels, you produce CO2. And uh, since the dawn of the industrial age, we have simply ejected it into the atmosphere. And it essentially stays for our purposes forever, for very long periods of time. And so consequently, we're building up CO2 in the atmosphere, and this is the legacy of Keeling and his colleagues uh, here. The implications of this are uh, significant. Uh, first of all, because of the strong link between uh, access to energy, it's not, it's not causal again, it's correlated, but the strong access to, uh, sufficient access to energy and improved quality of life means there's a strong drive, a strong motivator for people to want to have at least enough, okay? You could argue maybe some of us use too much, but most of the people, as we'll see in a moment, have way too little. As a consequence, by the middle of the century, it's likely that we will more than double our energy demand so that the power production rate will approach 30 trillion watts of power by 40 years from now. Uh, our current energy economy cannot be sustained as a result. The resources are finite because they're fossil fuels. Uh, we have vastly unequal access to those resources around the world. They impose severe climate and environmental impacts, and there are serious energy security issues that come with that. Uh, system. And so a profound revolution in how we acquire and use uh, energy is needed. So um, I would argue that UCSD should uh, set as a, one of its strategic goals in the coming decades uh, to become known for making groundbreaking discoveries and innovations in energy production and use uh, that meet the energy demands and energy needs, not of just the rich world, but for everyone and it should do so in a clean and sustainable way. This, I think, uh, is, fits well with the legacy and the, uh, the history of this institution. These are, I would say, these elements are still developing as we have conversations around campus, but I can begin to see a number of uh, issues that would, elements that could be uh, associated with such an effort. First of all, appropriate clean energy in the impoverished world. I'll say a, moment, a few comments about each one of these topics in a moment carbon-free and sustainable uh, uh, electricity and transportation fuels? Uh, can we weaken the correlation between energy access and quality of life? This uh, begins to get into the issues that Peter was talking about. And we need to evaluate the impacts of any new approaches that we introduce because of the scale of the problem. So let's talk about each one of those in just a moment. And in order to really pursue this, we require a broad engagement across campus really across all elements of campus, and not just a campus, but with government, with nonprofits, with uh, philanthropy, and uh, industry and utilities. Our colleagues at SIO have an uh, interesting way of uh, 
uh, illustrating this first point. This is work by Ramanathan uh, and his colleagues at SIO. Three billion people rely on biomass, mostly dung and scavenged firewood, as their principal source of energy, mostly for cooking. And uh, the, the uh, combustion of that fuel produces tremendous amount of soot uh, because of the poor quality of the, of the uh, combustion process that's occurring. And so Ram did an experiment in one village of about 1,000 families and replaced the traditional stove with something that would burn the same fuel but more cleanly. And took real data over the course of over a year and showed that there's a very large reduction in pollution production. That has not only profound human health effects for the affected population, where you could, you could avoid over a million premature deaths, but it has a profound effect on the Earth's climate balance uh, because those pollutants are also short-lived climate forcing gases. This is a uh, piece of uh, plot taken from uh, Ram's recent work. And the bottom line is if you could somehow propagate that simple technology somehow to uh, the people who are using that, uh, what it does is, you know, when you look at the effect on the Earth's thermal balance over the next uh, 50 to 75 years, is it delays the onset of severe warming by 20 to 40 years, simply by making that change. But the question is, how do you get that technology propagated, not to a village of 1,000 families, but to a billion people or more? Well, that is really an interdisciplinary problem. Could you create a profit incentive for those adopters? Could you drive down the costs so that this is an affordable technology, this is an engineering issue? Can we use social science work to increase the social uptake of these types of technologies so that you can actually get to scale and have these kinds of effects? And critically, we buy time for the next piece of the energy transition that has to occur, which is in the, what uh, some people call the sort of developed world, I call the rich world where more, the more high-tech traditional thoughts that we have about new energy technologies tend to apply, say, carbon-free electricity and transportation. UCSD has a tremendous wealth of, uh, of strength in these areas across multiple divisions. There's too much work here to try to call out every one, so I'll just highlight a couple. Um, could we produce sustainable liquid fuels in a way that scales to the need? So this is work uh, by colleagues in biology, at SIO, uh, physical sciences and in engineering, where uh, uh, Steve Mayfield and his colleagues are uh, looking at how to uh, engineer biofuel production using algae, using the state-of-the-art knowledge of uh, biological systems uh, to go from basic laboratory studies to prototypical studies to solar pilot plant scales here on campus and then try to partner to transition that to the scale necessary to really impact the problem. We have colleagues in physical sciences who are basically trying to uh, learn how to make artificial photosynthesis work, that is take CO2 and water and turn them into liquid fuels by energy input from solar photons. Uh, my own work, uh, we have a major group here that works in controlled nuclear fusion. I had to say a word about it. The world's uh, industrialized countries have partnered and are building the world's largest physics experiment now. It's uh, in terms of people and money, it's actually uh, bigger in scale than the Large Hadron Collider. Uh, being built in France, and by 2020, will begin to operate, and will show for the first time that we can harness energy from controlled nuclear fusion. We then have to figure out how to turn that into a practical energy source, and that means that people like me, who study plasma physics, these are pictures from our own research, have to talk to people in material science, people doing superconductivity research, radiation-resistant materials, to see can we make this practical or not. Finally, one of the unique elements of this campus is the microgrid. Our investments in large-scale solar PV uh, power production on campus, a brand new uh, fuel cell that's fueled by uh, renewable uh, gas sources. We have the leading faculty experts in the country, if not the world, on forecasting forward in time, anywhere from a minute to an hour to a couple days, how much resource will be available. And we have now the software, the power analytics, to use that knowledge to then test the hypothesis. Can a campus, or really a small city of 50,000 people, operate uh, with high reliability and high penetration renewably generated electricity? Can we really do that? We have all the pieces now to test that hypothesis. In the last few moments, can we begin to weaken this link between energy access and human quality of life? 
This really obviously clearly overlaps with the design initiative. How do we use energy? How do we incentivize people uh, and adopt policies that allows us to try to weaken that link? And because of the scale of the problem, the final topic is basically discovering the unknown unknowns. If you scale any of these technologies to the point where it really begins to matter, it is inevitable that there will be surprises. And uh, we have to sort of look at what are the effects of what we're doing on an ongoing basis. This is just illustrating the issue. We've all heard of shale uh, fracking to get more natural gas. Sounds like a good idea because gas has half the carbon intensity of coal, except at least these colleagues from Cornell are arguing that Bob at one or 2% trickles out uh, unburned and methane is an extraordinarily powerful greenhouse gas and that effect is you actually make the problem worse. Is that true or not? It's an open uh, debate in the scientific literature, but we will find out. So these elements would draw from the whole university. What is needed? We've got to figure out where we want to go, get faculty across the divisions, get support from the administration, uh, create a common intellectual space and uh, opportunity for continuous interactions across all disciplines, recruit the right people, and get the core facilities and collaborations going. The analogy that I think of, and this is the revolution that I want to put in your mind, is the revolution we've seen in communication technologies. In 1980, this is how we talked to people, this is how we got information, this is how we did computing on this sort of antiquated systems. Today, this is sort of what we're all familiar with, the internet, wireless devices, pervasive computing, and massive data. Where did this science and technology come from to allow that to occur? Well, I'm going to give a parochial example. You'll forgive me because we are at UCSD. But I would say, and one example of this is this campus partnering with places like Qualcomm to invent the science and then translate it into application. We need to do the same thing in energy. And I think we know how to do this. We have done this sort of thing before with the Moore's Cancer Center, CalIT2, the new Sanford Consortium that we just talked about earlier. We need to do the same sort of thing in the energy space. I think that would then uh, be a goal that's worthy of a legacy that we've all inherited from the people who started this university. And I think it would, its achievement would, should be part of a legacy that we leave so that in 2060, when the 100th anniversary of UCSD is celebrated, that we can celebrate this accomplishment and this contribution to society. So thank you to all the colleagues that I've talked with, and thank you for your attention. So I hope this is just an appetizer, a sampler of some of the exciting things that are going on. I hope you also see the interconnections that link these initiatives together. So we're really very, very excited about it. And we feel that we've chosen not only the right initiatives, initiatives to highlight, but we believe that we will have success in these because of the following five points that I want to make. First, we have already a very strong nucleus of faculty in every one of these areas. These are outstanding faculty that we've hired and we hope to invest more in the future. So we're really building on strengths and we're not starting these from scratch. Second, we really embrace the opportunity to move away from the existing disciplinary silos. And this is particularly important at a time when budgets are tight. We've really got to bring with the best synergies, the, the groups to work together on the campus. And in fact, the problems that we've chosen to attack really require these interdisciplinary teams to come together from diff different areas. So I love the idea of a university without walls where these students and faculty will come together in dynamic ways. So today's problem uh, may, may involve bringing together a couple of faculty here and tomorrow's problems may take you somewhere else, but that is precisely what UCSD is so good about. The third, the field of research, public policy and human health uh, diseases, all have tremendous uh, value in terms of societal impact. And so we really have picked problems that really ties into what the Washington Monthly ranked us so, so highly for two years in a row, that we are a university that's number one in the nation, not only with respect to our research and teaching, but with social mobility and societal impact. So this is really uh, fits the, the core of what our uh, uh, intellectual mission is. Of course, during the whole process, we've got to keep in mind the, the educational framework of what we provide to the students. Some of the questions that were asked by the audience alluded to that. Unfortunately, today we have not had time to go into that in depth, but we really feel that 
within each of these fields of research, there has to be an educational component which must be developed and in fact is being developed. And in, in doing this, we must ensure that we provide the next, next generation of students with the necessary tools, for example, quantitative skills in addition to pedagogical foundation. We must also ensure that every undergraduate has the access to an integrated and clearly defined uh, and articulated educational experience that really supports their intellectual growth as well as academic growth so that they, go, they can go out into society and, and have an important impact that reflects on what the campus provided them as tools. And finally, I, I hope that this will in turn, uh, uh, by focusing in these uh, research areas as well as the research mission, we will really help the community by providing uh, the workforce needs as a society and to produce engaged and productive citizens who can co contribute in a meaningful way to solve the societal problems that exist, not only just locally, but also nationally and, and globally. So with that, I really look forward to our continued conversation with all of you. I'd like all of you to join us. Uh, uh, I think some of the people will lead you to the place where the reception is going to be held and you'll have a chance to not only come up and meet the speakers, but there are additional faculty, and I'd also love to talk to you. So thanks so much for your time and your support, and uh, I, 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 uh, thank you again.